Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we have a very special guest with us today on the I Drink From Skulls podcast. He's the madman from Minnesota, the wild stallion from Wisconsin. <laughs> He's a family man. He's the founder of Renew Roofing, Mr. James Emerson. Thanks, man. How's it going? So how are you, James? For the for the people watching and, and listening along, who is James Emerson? Well, I'm a 39-year-old uh, father of four. I've got uh, four dogs and a basically a house house in the woods and land, and I own a bunch of businesses. Yeah, right. <laughs> Ma- mainly a roofing company. Mainly roofing company. Uh, yeah, for- yeah, it's the biggest business I got. Yeah, nice. What el- what else do you do? That's interesting. Well, I love cars. People that know me know I love anything with horsepower. Grew up uh, northern Wisconsin, born and raised. Uh, I moved out of state a couple times, but I always kind of came back. Really just enjoy, you know, kind of private lifestyle, you know, living in a small town community, you know, not a lot of, not a lot of stuff going on, but always opportunity to make money. And uh, yeah, it's like. I got into uh, I got into some trouble when I was younger, so that kind of you know set me up for almost failure. Yeah. Until I got my uh, you know re- removed my head out of my rear, and then uh, yeah, about ten years ago, I I really started buckling down on on business and uh, building a future that I could be proud of. That's that's me in a nutshell. Yeah, right. <laughs> and uh, I think it, that'll resonate with a lot of people, myself included. I've been in trouble. I've been on the wrong side of the tracks. And how? so how long ago was that? Was that 10, 15 years ago? Yeah, that was, uh, let's see, 2000, 2004 was the first first time. And I think 2000, 2008 yeah, right. was the last. Yep. So it was, it was a short time in my life where, you know, I was in and out of, getting arrested and being a troublemaker. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I guess with that, there, there's, it comes the the territory that comes with that is it's pretty hard to get a job. It's pretty hard for people to uh, trust in you. And, and I, I know from experience, I know a lot of people watching have had something similar happen. Um, well, not a lot of people, but you know, a good percentage, but you didn't let that sort of hold you back. H- how did you sort of get through that struggle? I'd love to hear that. Well, I mean, definitely getting into the trades, you know, it's kind of a statistic, I guess. Once you have a criminal record, I guess you you look toward, you know, being being more labor oriented, doing construction. You know, sadly, it's a, a statistic that you know a lot of construction workers have, you know, some sort of criminal record. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I started working as uh, framing framing houses, and then from there, I just kind of saw an opportunity where I could, you know, start a roofing company or actually it was exteriors. Yep. We started doing anything on the exterior of the building and, uh, just slowly progressed to do mostly, you know, roofing. Gotcha. But, uh, definitely owning your own business. You can, you can own your own business with a criminal record. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people do. Yeah. So don't have to apply for jobs anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> And for for reference, your based your hometown. There's not a big population there. Is that right? Is it Spooner? Spooner? Do I have that right? Yeah, Spooner, Wisconsin, is where our uh, our main office is, and it's uh, under two thousand people. So wow, very small town. Yeah. So when you say you live out in the woods, you weren't you weren't messing around here, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's more trees in northern Wisconsin than there are people. So that's crazy. It's uh. Very quiet, a lot of uh, a lot of privacy. There's, it, it's something to be said about this area that draws people in because there's a lot of we call them cabin people, but a lot of vacation homes. Yeah, where you know there's celebrities and you know a lot of people with a lot of money that just come up because they enjoy it because it's quiet. You know they can get away from their day to day hustle and bustle. Yeah, that makes sense. And that was, that was something I found very interesting when I first I got talking to Savannah, your lovely wife, um, who, you know, has a big part of your business as well. This is probably three or four years ago now. 
That's what she said. She said, we live out in a very small area in terms of population, been very successful with the roofing and exteriors business, which that in itself is just really powerful, just owning owning your part of the world and, and having that type of success out there. But you wanted to grow. You wanted to grow. And fast forward three, four years later um, to when I was speaking with you, you guys now operate in, in four states. Is that right? Yeah, we are uh, currently... Wisconsin, Minnesota, Missouri, and Texas. Well, wow. um, we're licensed in nine different states, and we're actually registered to do business in, I, I want to say, 15. Wow. Just kind of planning ahead for the future where we might, you know, take things. So, yeah. Building to grow yeah. is basically, what, you know, what we're about. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it was a tough decision really to, you know, I guess to grow. Um, yeah. Yeah into more states, more, more, you know, places further away. Uh, it's, it's hard to manage, you know, the normal way. It's hard to manage on site like we're used to. Yeah. So a lot of stuff had to be automated and you really got to be able to trust people. Yeah. So that's a hard thing for a lot of people to do. What was the, like, I'd love to hear, um, some insights around what made you guys want to decide to code. Cause I'm, I'm fairly confident you would have been very comfortable, very successful, had your own, you know, part of the world carved out. And what what sort of led you guys to say, you know what, we're gonna we're we're not just gonna stay here, where we're very, you know, we're very happy. We're gonna make this thing big. I think it it really took a turn when we started getting involved in other groups, and and meeting with people, you know, around the country that where like we might be. You know, one of the big fish, you know, Kurt Linnington actually talked about it on a podcast he was on this week and, and how you're, you're almost a, a big fish in a little pond Yeah, and you can't grow anymore. So we wanted to get around, you know, people that were bigger than us. And once we started doing that, we were almost forced to grow more. Gotcha. So we needed to get, you know, get out of our pond uh, per se, our local area, in order to grow it, you know, and keep growing. There's only a certain amount of roofs that you could do in a population that's, you know, 2,000. And then, you know, you work out from there, okay, you might get 10,000. If you drive, you know, travel 100 miles in any direction, you could probably get 100,000. But to get to the, the places where there's population of, you know, a million plus, yeah. where, I mean, we see these guys on, online all the time they're they're doing 10 million dollars a month in in roofs well that's going to be pretty difficult to do when there's not 10 million dollars worth of roofs just sitting around you know yeah Uh, you know in a small population a lot of the other uh reason was we wanted to keep working all year round gotcha so northern wisconsin minnesota we have a basically a six month season or less uh because i mean frozen tundra up here getting cold just thinking about it um (laughs) yeah just saw some eskimos walking by it's crazy like (laughs) um but it it really is it's it's hard to uh it's hard to sit back for us you know it's it's hard for us to sit back and just watch you know other people in other states you know the warmer climates just sit back and watch them they're killing it all year right They're making money all year and we have a hurry up, kick ass for, for six months, you know, five, six months. And then, you know, okay, now we're slowing back down that that's not how we want to work, you know, because we can make five, 10, you know, 15 million in revenue in, in six months. That's awesome. Yeah. When we were talking about expanding, what, what's going to make us you know, what, what's going to be easier, expand into a, another location where we can work all year or expand into another location like, you know, Minneapolis yep. where, yeah, we can pull 10 million out of there in the same six month period that we're doing here. Yeah. And it's like, I don't know, I'd rather pull 10 million and do it comfortably, you know, in Missouri or Texas. Yeah. And I, re- I remember the initial sort of attack if you will from going like the 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 initial expansion um and i want to sort of give give the viewers a bit of game on that initially 
you had your home base and then you were like, okay, we'll go inland, we'll go towards the, the next biggest city. Was that sort of the approach into, into like through yeah. Wisconsin and into Minnesota? Yeah. Yeah, it, it definitely was. So our, basically our path was, we know how small towns operate. We're, we're already, you know, able to basically go into any small town and we know how to market to the people. We know what the people want. You know, I grew grew up in a small town, so yep. understand how everybody thinks. Yep. So instead of going directly into the biggest market, so like even Green Bay or, uh, you know, Milwaukee, Madison, those are all surrounded by smaller communities. Yep. So instead of going directly to the, you know, the highest population, you start hitting the suburbs or the smaller, smaller towns that, you know, maybe they just get forgot because the the uh, contractors are are all focused on the large population. Yeah, and uh, it's I mean it it's easy to see too, especially when a storm rolls through. If a storm hits Minneapolis, St. Paul, you know nobody's thinking about you know Stillwater. Yeah, <laughs> or and, and that's a big big population too, a couple hundred thousand. Yeah, but it's it, it's it's crazy because. You look even smaller and you find a town that's 10,000 or 5,000. Well, everybody's focused on a million population versus five, you know, 5,000. You can go into that town and you can easily pull 500 jobs. Yeah. And that's 10%. Yeah. And five, 500 jobs, there's no reason you shouldn't be, you know, pulling 15, 20 million off that. It's just, that's unbelievable. Like, not unbelievable, it's just outstanding. I think that's probably something yourself and Savannah taught me many years ago inadvertently. Attack where no one else is looking and it, it's, um, it, it can be a goldmine for, you, for your business, for your employees. And it doesn't matter how you attack it, whether it's on the, with boots on the ground, SEO, ads, whatever you're doing to get attention and get in front of people. That is where there's a major opportunity where no one else is looking. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, what we like to do is be a little bit different than the large companies, yeah. but be a lot different than the small, like one or two man, you know, contractor companies. Gotcha. So we want to mirror what the big companies do, but at the same time, we're going to do that in smaller population. I like that. So. What are those sorts of things that you like to, to like to do to differentiate? We do uh, a lot of automations. So there's there's guys, you know, you get in any small town, small town contractors. I mean, there's people that are still handwriting uh, proposals, yep. carbon copy paper, <laughs> like from, from Office Depot or something. Old school. Yeah, <laughs> real old school. Um, so we, we use a lot of different, like, technology to make things uh, easier. And more, more streamlined. Surprisingly, a lot of our customers actually, you know, we sign and and go through the entire the entire sales process online. So like over email, yeah, uh, they can they can sign all the contracts and stuff online. We've had customers we've never even met, and we, yeah. I mean, they're happy that they can get their investment properties, you know, get a new roof on it, new siding, whatever. And they don't have to, they don't have to visit that property. Yeah. They don't have to set an appointment or, or get there. And, uh, you know, I don't want to say waste their time, but they, I mean, when people like that show up to, you know, their vacation home or investment property, they don't want to be bothered by spending four or five hours with multiple contractors. Yeah. That, I mean, they just want, they know they need a roof. They know they need siding, whatever. They just want the price and they want to, you know, know when it's done. Gotcha. So you make the process very streamlined, efficient, <laughs> and effective. I love that. Right. Yeah. Yep. Just to sort of a little bit of a different note there, you've, you've done extremely well um, in the colder states. And then you thought, why not look at some warmer, warmer pastures? Is that right? Inroads into Texas yeah, and, and Missouri, yes. yeah. Yep. So we were uh, basically flying to Texas anyway, and uh, you know we're in a group there, 
uh, called Apex, and we were flying there every month just to uh, be in that group. And then yeah. basically since we were there once a month anyway, we're like, well, why don't we, why don't we do some business here? Yeah. And, uh, well, everybody knows Texas gets all the hail, so it's pretty... It, it's relatively simple to to do business. Yeah, put it that way. Yeah, nuts. No, Crews are easy to find. Jobs are easy to find. That's uh, that's the one thing about Texas I I definitely appreciate. Love that. Also, it would would be nice to live there, but you know we've got prior engagements with kids and stuff here. Look at you. You know. Yeah, I was going to give you a gold medal for having the four right from right at the start. Four kids. And a business owner, that's that's <laughs> yeah. that's the end of the day there. That's crazy. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of gray hair. <laughs> I'll bet. <laughs> I could barely handle one. <laughs> um, <laughs> you, you mentioned something there that I want to dig into, and it's because it, it's, it's probably made to sound a little bit easy um, in terms of your expansion. I, I know it wouldn't have been, but you ha- you're, not, you're not able to be in, the, in all your offices at, at any one time which means to me, you've, you've built a team. This has to be a lot of virtual. Um, you have to have in, invested in and put trust in uh, quite a number of key personnel, which to me means that you've, you've clearly built a culture that people buy into and believe in. So I want to dig into that a little bit and hear sort of your perspective on building a culture and managing teams across multiple states. We all know like sales is what we need to, to grow and, and, you know, produce jobs in that area. So sales reps, man, I, I, it, it's hard actually to, to find sales reps that can self motivate yeah. and work remotely. And you know, they, they come and go, yeah. um, different, different areas, you know, have different type of sales reps. So it's Texas is actually a, a hard state to find sales reps because there's so much, you know, so many people that are wanting or willing to jump ship yeah. for an extra dollar or something when you really got to break it down for people and show them what benefit it actually is or isn't to to stay or leave um, and sometimes it, you know you got to have that conversation with people where it is actually beneficial for them to go and yeah move on to a different company yeah and there's nothing wrong with that because they're either not going to be a hundred percent for you or your company because they're always going to think the grass is greener anyway. Yeah. And then something that I've always heard is, you know, the grass is always greener, you know, where you water it. I like that. So it's like, if they're thinking it's greener elsewhere, you know, you can either show them how, okay, you can grow here, but if you're still not going to be happy, you really believe that you're going to be happy somewhere else, just let them go. Yeah. But as far as, you know, building culture and stuff, I mean, it's, you want to find people that, you know, that you would enjoy hanging out with, right? Like they, they say, don't mix friends with, with business or business with friendships or, you know, your employees can't become your friends, but at the same time, you're going to spend most of your time with those people yeah. or, or vice versa. And if if you can't stand somebody, then you're not going to, like, you can't stand to be around them. You're not going to enjoy working with them. Yeah. Whether it's for an hour or two hours or whatever. So I think John Paramore actually told me, like, find people that you, you know, or hire people that you can see going on a vacation with yeah. for like a month. And that's the type of person that you need to be, you know, be hired on. You know, it's it's hard to, you know, look at your employees that way. If you're not able to see that as the vision, like, oh yeah, you know, I don't want to hang out with these people at, at, uh, at work and at, you know, on vacation. Yeah. Well then why do you have them working for you? Well, they're good at their job. Okay. But uh, are you miserable? Are they miserable? Just because you're good at the job doesn't mean that it's a good, it's a good fit. Yeah. I think that's kind of the culture we've built is like, we can, we can take any of our employees and we can go on a vacation or go on a trip or, you know, whatever it may be. Yeah. And we, we can all enjoy ourselves, but at the end of the day, we can also go make, a, you know, a bunch of money. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's definitely, uh, definitely the key there. That's great advice too. 
they always say if you, if you want to know where you sit with someone, take them on a vacation. That in itself, that's great yeah. advice. That sort of makes a lot of sense to me that you've been able to have the success you've had. And just in terms of success, you're predicted to do yeah. uh, 20 mil this year. Is that right? That's that's no easy feat. Yeah, that's that's my that's my goal. Yep. Um, and, uh, you know, going to push everybody pretty hard, I think. Uh, but we are onboarding a, a lot of new people too. So obviously we were able to do very, very few people last year. We were able to, you know, pull 10 million out of small town. It's amazing. Um, so to 20 million, we're going to have more than double the amount of, uh, reps we have. Yeah. So I don't see it being an issue. You know, there's always going to be growing pains. Yeah. So you got to prepare for that. And as long as everybody works together, you know, the end goal is going to be the same. So. Yeah. Nice. No, just on growing pains. How, what have you sort of seen and experienced so far? Oh man. Well, there's always the pain of sales exceeding production. And then the opposite of that is uh, production catching up to sales yeah. and then wondering, I mean, where's the next job going to be? So there was last year, there was a time we were doing about 120 roasts a month wow. and we were running multiple crews, but at the same time, we weren't trying to book out jobs further than two weeks. Yeah. And the reason being, we want to produce everything quickly. Yeah. But the crews, this is, you know, some of our crews want to know like a month uh, in advance, what do they got? Yeah. So trying to, you know, put the, I guess the trust, get, get the crews trust that don't worry. We're, we're booked out, you know, here's two weeks of work for you. The third week's coming, the fourth week's coming, you know, having them have that trust in us that, you know, if it was a new crew that they weren't used to the way we were, you know, do business. Yeah. So, but it all worked out. I mean, we kept five crews busy as ever, and we still got a bunch of uh, leftover from last year that we got to get, you know, produced as, as soon as the snow is gone. So. Yeah. yeah. I could, I, I imagine that would be quite the battle. You got to keep the crews busy. You got to keep people scheduled in. But you don't want it to the schedule to be too far in advance because people will cancel. They'll try and find someone else. It must be a very tight balance yeah, act, especially when there's you know storm chasers around or whatever too. Where there we can get you you know done, or or we can get you on our schedule a lot faster. It, it, it's always a pitch. Yep, we're trying to always be no more than two weeks out. Yep, just always have that that quick turnaround on on uh, production. Yep. I love that. One other thing I've I've noticed, and I want to talk to you about your process, is that I see that you've been, you, you know, you get lots of great reviews. Um, is that something you guys are focused on? Is there, there quality assurance in play? I'd love to talk a bit, bit about that. Yeah, so reviews are, are definitely in one of our focuses. It's actually difficult sometimes to get a positive review yeah. if you're a business owner. It's crazy, like... And I, I've even caught myself doing it sometimes. Like I'll I'll go out to eat or something. I'll I'll have a really good meal, and then maybe I'll you know I'll go through a whatever car wash or something that I spend fifteen dollars on a car wash and my car's not clean. And I'm like, man, I should write a bad review yeah. about this place or something. Like maybe they'll they'll check into it. But it's like, yeah, what's the point, you know? But uh, it it's I think mentally for people, it's always easier to focus on the negative. Yeah than it is the positive. So you almost have to offer, or not even offer, it's almost like you have to have the review pulled up and ready yes. for the customer. And you, you have to have basically done 99% of the work for them. Yes. They just have to like type it in and then, and, and you know, put submit. It's it's crazy. Like, otherwise it's like less than five minutes to write a review or, yeah. or give somebody, you know, four or five stars. But that's five minutes of somebody's, you know, a day that, eh, you know, do I really need to spend that time with that? Not really. Yeah. Do I, do I love the work you did? Yeah. I, I love it. Oh, can you, can I have five minutes of your time? Ooh, I don't know. No, <laughs> I'm pretty busy. Yeah. Do what? Crochet in the, you know, rug over there or something? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's where it is. Mowing the lawn. I gotta go mow the lawn. Okay. See you, Bob. Yeah. And that's, that's something I've noticed. Yeah. You've, you've got to, like you just said, you've got to make it easy for them. You've got to do the work for them. You've got to get them at the, at the optimal time of when they're happy, which most of the time is when you're handing, you know, shaking their hand, you've done your walk around and things like that. 
And then it's then and there, and then you've got your nice little pitch. You've earned that review with them. You let them know this is how you grow your business, your local family-owned business, da-da-da-da-da. But yeah, if you don't do that and you try and do it through automation, which is great, they, you'll get far less. So I, I think that's um, the fact that you'd figured that out shows me how, you know, why you've been able to cultivate so many great reviews and grow in so many different areas, like different states. Yeah. We, I mean, we do the automation stuff too. We yeah. get, you know, email automations and you name it, but it's like, we don't get as good a, as good a, you know, feedback yeah. from that as if we, as if the reps are out there doing it. They have to be the one that's requesting that their homeowner, the person they were working with, like right here, okay, this is where you write the review. Yeah. Go ahead and do it. Or this is where you click how many stars, you know, rate me with the stars. Yep. It's simple as that. I yep. mean, they don't even have to write a, it, it's great if they write a review, but just here, how many stars you give yep. me? Four. Okay. Well, why four? Why not five? Well, I don't know. Here, I'll give you five. Then. <laughs> Appreciate it. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> it's like half the, half the, half the people don't even understand what the stars mean or anything. Yeah. So they're like, oh, well, I, I don't want to give you too many. And <laughs> I don't, I, I'm not going to give you three. You were really good, but. Well, I don't know if you're five good. Okay, well, if it was a scale of one to ten, how many would you give me? I'd give me nine, nine and a half. Okay, well, let's take nine and a half, transfer that to five. So, you, yeah, you basically give me four and three quarters. So let's just round out, and right? Give me a five. <laughs> yeah, it's crap. I mean, that's, that's human nature. That's really what you got to do with people. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I get that. And are you also at the same time as the rep, or is it is it trained into them? Um, are they asking for referrals? Have, do you feel that they, they, they've earned that at that stage? Is that how you guys approach it? This is like what I do and what I tell people and I train my guys and, and gals what to do Yeah. Um, as far as referrals. So this 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 is some behind the scenes the big stuff. Like detail. There we go. Yeah. So I ask for re uh, referrals before they even sign. So yeah. <laughs> It's like subliminally making them do business with you. Nice. So picture this, you know, I'm with a homeowner, going to present them the estimate or I'm, you know, doing an inspection on their house or whatever. And uh, before I even ask them to sign anything or, or do business with me, I ask them like, hey, do you know anybody that could benefit from, you know, the same service that I provided you today? You know, maybe it was just a free inspection or whatever for uh, storm damage. And right away, what are they thinking? Subliminally, they're, they're going to think that if I give you some names and referrals, I'm going to get a better deal or I'm going to get something in return. Yeah. So they're going to start, you know, two, three names, you know, oh, what's their number? What's their address? Oh, well, Susie Smith just lives right down the street. Oh, you want to walk there so before you even get them to sign anything they're already committing to their friends and the people they know that they're doing business with you yeah because they're referring you to their friends they're they're not going to be the one that says oh yeah i've referred you to the that guy but i'm i'm not doing business with him yeah oh well why not yeah well this other guy was cheaper well we did business with him i love that so that right away you get get the referrals up front and then again Ask for more referrals when you when they sign, and then ask for more referrals when the job's completed, and then a month later ask for some more referrals. Yeah, because why not? Everybody's once you build that that trust, and a lot of guys you know do like a referral incentive program, and nothing wrong with that. Yeah, you know send them a gift card or something for you know go out to dinner or something nice dinner if they're. You know, if they're working for you, do something nice for them. Yeah. I always ask for referrals up front. So a lot of people call me crazy, but I'm like, gets people thinking like, okay, well, if I give you something, if I give you something, you're going to give me something back. So I'm going to get either a discount or I'm going to get, you know, I'm going to get that prize. It's actually the, the, one of the core principles of influence is reciprocity. And that's, that's happening automatically. It's human nature. I give you value. You're going to give me value. And that's what's happening um, vice versa there, but you're getting a micro commitment and you're getting an investment into the process, which just immediately what hit me would be confidence. You're so confident in the result that you're going to provide that you're already, you're asking how 
you can grow your business by by helping this person and uh it seems to be working really well for you so i love that you shared the the deep dive there that was awesome the tips and tricks <laughs> the hacks <laughs> i love that yeah <laughs> <laughs> something that i noticed i i don't know if it was late last year or mid last year but a ma there was you, your markets were hit with plenty of different storms major storms but i remember you posting and talking about how you know there were all your competitors were boots on the ground trying to slay everyone and their next door neighbor to get on a roof whereas you had tons of business come into you i kind of have an idea of how you did it but i'd love you to share because there was some big numbers done something like a million bucks in a weekend or which to me shows how many people you're able to help at scale but i'd love to hear if you're if you're keen to share um, how that happened. Yeah. We've built the reputation of being the, you know, local roofing company that can get things done. So we're not, like I said, we don't push things out further than two weeks. Yep. Um, if we can avoid it. So when a storm hit, our phones ring off the hook. Yep. I mean, we had within the first week after the storm hit, I want to say we had over 450, 500 phone calls wow. of leads, yeah. hot leads coming in. Just, I mean, what do you do? So we started just getting reps and, and anybody that can go sign a piece of paper, that's it. But yeah, it's, it's, it's nice when, you know, you see all the storm chasers coming in and they're knocking doors and, and they're trying to, you know, sign up as many people as they can just by, you know, boots on the ground getting in front of people yeah. and we're like we've got so many leads that I, I don't have time to knock doors like we need more people so that we can run these leads yeah. and then if we even want to attempt knocking doors we're going to need even more people to do that yeah so at the end of like a three-month period we had three thousand some leads wow just from calling in yeah so i mean we didn't we didn't really knock a door except for you know the neighbors after a lead or something we we go do an inspection. We'd walk over to the neighbor if we saw him outside or something. It was crazy. Yeah. yeah I mean, it, it's it's really about building that reputation in the small town first. Yeah. So. Yeah. So you'd invested in in brand reputation, online stuff, probably. Well, not probably. You did, and it all it all it, you were ready for the storm, whilst everyone was trying to hit it after. Something huge. We've always tried to prepare. Yeah for the storms before they hit. Yeah. Because otherwise you've got, I mean, you could have a storm hit, even a small town, 2,000 people. You're going to need marketing materials. You're going to need to, I mean, if, if you haven't been marketing to that, that, you know, area to begin with, you're going to have to have a lot more ad spend just to get in front of people yeah. fast. So... It's more like the trickle effect, like the the constant drippy faucet that everybody hears, but nobody wants to, you know, fix it yeah. until they need it. Yeah. So we drip drip market, you know, we'll we'll put constantly run ads, constantly running, um, Facebook, Google, you know, all that stuff. But it's not we're not breaking the bank doing it. Yeah. But it keeps that you know brand recognition at the top for when people do need you because the last time nobody's gonna look up roofing companies unless they need one. yeah there's a stop so e even if you're spending thousands a, a week on ads if nobody needs a roofing company what good are your ads yeah target you know if you simply run the ads when like a drip then when you know there's an event like a hailstorm okay now you can now you can put a little more in there keep you at the top but now you're getting organic you know because people are searching roofing companies in the area yeah well they're going to search you, you know roofing companies in that area and guess who's not going to pop up all the storm chasers that's right yeah but you are because you've been constantly running yeah yeah i mean you you've been posting there you've been running ads i mean you name it you're going to be the one that they call because you're the local one. Yeah. I like being the first call, you know, but even if we're the third, fourth call, we'll still probably get the job. Yeah. I love that. 
This is a psychological principle that it happens to every every human. It's called the mere exposure effect, and it states that it's pretty simple. But it states that um, people are more likely to do business with people that they already know, that they've been exposed to multiple multiple times. They don't even know why they do it. Um, it goes into that trust, credibility, and authority factor. But if you're running ads and different marketing materials, it doesn't have to be ads, but the the things that you're doing to be seen by people multiple times, building trust and credibility over and over and over again. When they do need you, bang, you're first of, first of mine, they're calling yeah. you. And that seems like that's what's happened. Um, 400 calls as the storms come in. You did well to handle them all, to be, to be fair to you. That's, that's amazing. So yeah, I love that. It was actually crazy you tried I'll to bet. handle that many. <laughs> um, it, it was quite an influx of, uh, of leads, so it was cool. Now we're even more prepared for for something like that. So that's awesome. You know, learn learn from the past. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. And you're you're ready to attack. Were were there some things that went wrong with that? There's always things that go wrong, and with you know, influxes like that. Like, how did you yeah. sort of battle through that? We had some missed appointments. You know, so that, I mean, yeah, there's always things that go wrong. Yeah, you know, missed appointments. You know, even with the automations. Um, double booked and being in a rural area too and the, the storm swath was so large some appointments were you know could be in the same same zip code right but that zip code covers a 50 mile radius yeah so it might take you longer than 15 minutes to get from one one lead to the next and scheduling those those uh inspections and stuff that was that was kind of a hard hard thing to do i guess schedule them all you know efficiently yeah so that you accounted for drive time as well because normally we weren't scheduling you know leads that close together yeah. it'd be okay we're going to give you an hour leeway in between a lead well when you got so many leads you're like okay how many can we fit in in you know the next 16 hours so we'd smash them together and if they were in the same zip code they would get smashed together like say if if they were in Spooner, okay, well this one's Spooner and that one's Spooner it shouldn't take you more than fifteen minutes to get there. Well, if you're on one side of Spooner, you know where the zip code covers, and you can go forty minute drive and you'll be at the other side of Spooner, and it's like, oh man, um, you know, and it's trees and lakes that you're driving around, yeah. but it, it's a long drive. Yeah. So that was that was a big issue. Um, we did get a a program, a mapping program. Nice. That uh, yeah. we can basically type in the different addresses, and it'll populate the the most efficient route to get get around them. So it, it worked out. I love that. But that was one of the things, you know. Have a couple uh, failures, and you learn from it, and keep pushing. You know, do better next time. Yeah. 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 Absolutely love that. There, there was some people that got angry about it. It's kind of like a percentages thing. <laughs> you, there's always going to be a few things yeah. that go wrong, and on the scale. Like we never want anything to go wrong, but it's just, it's a fact of business yeah. and life. And seems like you've learned from that as, which if all you did was focus on the the couple of things that went wrong, it, it wouldn't be good. Yeah. And it's like, if you look at the percentage, like you said, you know, you get a thousand new customers in a, in a month or two months. I mean, something's going to go wrong. Yeah. That's a lot of people. Something's going to get overlooked. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's just, it's numbers. So if, if. 0.1% of something, you know, is, is going to go wrong. Well, guess what? In a thousand people, you're going to have one, one screw up. If, if your screw ups are one out of every hundred, well, you're going to have 10 yeah. and a thousand. So <laughs> it's like, just prepare for it, learn from it, do better and, uh, you know, make it right. With those numbers, you're going to do like out of a thousand people. And I, I get to say this cause I don't work with the homeowner, but out of a thousand homeowners, you're going to do something absolutely perfect and they're still going to say it's wrong because they're they're challenging yeah. to deal with. That's a nice way to put it. That's probably too nice for the I Drink From Sales yeah. podcast, but I think you know what I mean. <laughs> Wouldn't matter yeah. what you did. They'll find Trust fault. Me. They'll find problems. Yeah. Kind of a pain in the ass. Yeah. It's part of the battle. Yeah, and it, it really is. And like I can pick up on that just because of all the years that I've, I've been dealing with customers. Yeah. And it, it's like a learned experience thing. But I can see like the, you go out to dinner and maybe four or five tables across, you know, you, 
sit down for a steak dinner and this this person over here ordered a steak dinner and they ate the entire thing but they're still complaining about yeah. it. That's the same type of person that's going to did the job perfectly, did everything you said you were going to do, went above and beyond, and they're still going to complain about it. Yeah. And yeah, it bothers you. It. I mean, what do you do though? Yeah. I mean, it's like those types of people you're almost doomed to try and make happy. That's right. So yeah. Move on. There's, there's try not to focus too much on the negative ones, even though, like I said, it, you know, everybody knows it's easier to focus on the negative than it is the positive. Yeah. So it's been, it has been tough to, you know, disregard so much of the negative, especially in the roofing industry. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of negative stuff going on, but it's like, if you want to be part of all the negative, it's just going to be drama or you can focus on what you can control and that's the good and, you know, everything in your, your own you know, business, your own life. So great sort of thing to finish on there as we're, we're almost out of time. Um, but I'd love to know any, any final words, final thoughts for our viewers and subscribers. Man, what do you, what do you want for final thoughts? (laughs) (laughs) How you're approaching 2023, you know, in a weird economic climate, maybe that's a good way to finish. Yeah, that, that is a good, good way. Um, definitely going to focus on, um, financing. Yep. Um, Especially with kind of the, you know, the climate we're in with the, with the uh, economy and stuff, you know, ups and downs all the time that news is always trying to scare people. I don't watch too much of the news, but yeah. apparently there's like two big banks that just went belly yeah. up or something. I don't know what's going on, but, but definitely, uh, you know, making our products more affordable through financing is, uh, is definitely going to be a focus especially if there's not a, not a good storm. Yeah. You know, there's going to be storms, you know, throughout the year, they're not going to go away, but if they don't hit, you know, a good, good area for us to target, then uh, we're going to have to get creative and, and really, you know, hammer the retail again. Yeah. And I think, you know, pushing financing, you know, that's going to help. Absolutely. I think that's really the direction that most of the trades industries are going anyway. Yeah. Because uh let's face it, not not a ton of people have ten to twenty thousand dollars that they want to just hand over for a new roof for siding or you know, even even HVAC, you know, some air conditioning and stuff. I mean that's it's hard to convince somebody to give you all that money yeah. that they worked so hard for. But if you can get it to them for, you know, you know, less than 7.99 or 9.99 for, you know, 180 months. Cool. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, going to cost them 120 bucks a month or something. I mean, now it's, now it's four. That's right. Yeah. They can see that it's only a cup of coffee a day or something yeah. that they're, that's, you know, got to save on it. So. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, that's our focus. I think. I love that. James, where can people find you, mate? If they want to connect with you, they want to learn more about roofing or, or even looking for an opportunity, where would the best place be to find you? Uh, Facebook is usually uh, the easiest, or they can uh, look me up on our, our website and you contact us through our website. Or uh, Facebook and Instagram is probably the easiest. Right. And uh, anyone's got any questions, they need some help with uh, anything as far as roofing or, or business, you know, if I can help, I'll help you. I love that. So. Always giving back. I just want to thank you for sharing some time with the I Drink From Skulls podcast. You've been amazing. Um, and that's a, that's a wrap. That's it from us. Uh, stay tuned for the next episode. Bye.